Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come before you tonight. We praise your name because of what you've done for us, individually and collectively as a church. We pray that as we see the closing chapter, which we've been studying for a long time, concerning Stephen, we pray that you'll make us to see the grace and the truth and the influence and the impact, the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon this man again so that we ourselves will be able to have more of your power and presence in our lives at all times in Jesus name Amen. in Jesus name we pray we have spent quite some time studying the life and the ministry of Stephen and we have spent quite a long time looking at the grace and the gifts of God in the life of this wonderful man. And as we have got a glimpse of what the power of God has done in his life, we cannot but just look up to God and say, what you have done in the life of this individual, do within us as well. And today we come to the end of chapter 7 which apparently is also the end of the life of Stephen. And he started his life, the time we've known him in the scriptures, in such a glorious way. And the end was glorious as well. And we have seen how God, in his power, by his presence, can be with his own children, and he could be our best for him in all situations. As we come to the close of Stephen's earthly life and ministry, I want you to see some contrasts in the chapter that we read now, the end of the chapter. We'll just quickly go through the end of the chapter because there is so much in this end of the chapter. And perhaps many preachers do not think of the much we have in the few verses that end up the life of this man and the chapter before us. I want you to see some contrasts there. The contrast between a spirit-filled man and a Satan-inspired mob. The contrast between the righteous and the religious. The contrast between a far-sighted visionary saint of God and a short-sighted vicious sinner. The contrast between love and hate. You see that in the closing part of this chapter. And many casual readers, they see Stephen as a victim as the chapter closes and his life ends. But no, you don't see Stephen as a victim, he's a victor. And he was even more than a conqueror. I want to remind you that the members of the Sanhedrin or the council had called him for questioning. They had accused him of four things. Number one, blasphemy against God. Number two, blasphemy against Moses. Number three, blasphemy against the law. And number four, blasphemy against the temple. These, I told you before, are great issues. They were great issues in the lives, in the policy, the religion of the children of Israel at the time. And they, they leveled this four count charge against him, against God, Moses, the law, and the temple. And they wanted him as an accused, as a criminal, as a lawbreaker, as a blasphemer to come before them and give them answers to the questions they were asking. And it, it's fantastic. It's just marvelous how this man stood before them without any fear of the consequence of the actions they were taking without any fear as to what their response will be and very systematically line upon line precept upon precept he went through the scriptures and he told them his faith his confidence in god and at the end of the whole thing he showed them that he was a firm believer in god he was a believer not a blasphemer and concerning Moses, he told them that he had received the ministry that God gave to Moses with a good spirit. That God chose Moses 
for a ministry, for a time, for a dispensation, for a period of time. And at that time, it was a necessary thing that Moses came to do. He told them that concerning the law, the law had been given. And the law had a time, a period, a dispensation. And for what the law was supposed to do, it was all right at the time it was given. And for the purpose it was given. Concerning the temple, he told them he believed in the temple. Only that they could not restrict the Almighty inside the confines of a small temple. Now, do you know that by the time he finished, he had told them that he was not the person they should accuse. If they wanted to find anybody that did not have faith in God, confidence in God, they were the people. If they wanted to find anybody that rejected Moses and rejected the greatest prophecy that came from the mouth of Moses concerning the Messiah, they were the people. And concerning the law, he told them the children of Israel had never obeyed the laws of God. And concerning the temple, he told them they were just misusing the temple. As they must remember that there was even a time Jesus made his scourge and he drove them out because they were making his father's house a den of thieves and robbers. And do you know that by the time he finished, he was no more talking like an accused, a criminal. He was talking like a witness, a true witness to the greatness and the glory of God, to the goodness and the kindness of God. And he was talking as a preacher, a preacher of divine truth, a preacher of the gospel, a preacher exalting Jesus Christ the Lord. And you know, he talked as a judge. They were sitting wanting to judge him, but then he gave a witness. The false witnesses were rising up, but he rose up and he was a true ambassador, a true witness. And the people who were making themselves to be the proclaimers of the truth in the nation, they were sitting down and they listened to this man as he was preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, going from one part of scripture to the other. And as these people were sitting down to judge Stephen, Stephen just stood firm and he became a judge to them. He addressed them as a witness, as a preacher, as a judge. As I come to the end of this chapter 7, I see a number of things, opposites, in the end of the chapter. On the part of the children of Israel, on the part of the members of the council, on the part of the people rejecting and resisting the truth, I see hate, cruelty, pride, a tragedy that they were in terrible darkness and confusion. And I saw the, the vengeance and the fanaticism of their lives. But on the side of, of Stephen, our man, the man of God, upon whom the Spirit of God was abiding, you see holiness, compassion, praying, triumph, calmness, vision, and forgiveness. And so then you can see, you put the sinners on the one side and the saints of God on the other side. You put these uh, people, the mob on one side and the minister of the gospel on the other side. What do you see when you look at the left and you look at the right? You see hate confronted with holiness. You see cruelty, but he responded to that cruelty with just compassion. You see their pride in their religion, but you see the praying of a righteous man. You see the tragedy on their side. You see the triumph of a man who knows the grace and the power of God. You see their confusion, but you see his calmness. You see their vision, and you hear about his vision. You see their fanaticism, and he talks about his own forgiveness for them. Above all and beyond all, you see grace and truth overcoming all evil. Now, as we look into the closing part of the chapter, come to chapter 7, reading from verse 54. Chapter 7 from verse 54. When they had heard these things, they were caught to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes, 
at the young at a young man's feet whose name was Saul and the stone Stephen calling upon God and saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice Lord lay not this sin to their charge and when he had said this he fell asleep and Saul was consenting unto his death. In this chapter for us to really understand, we're divided into four subheadings. Conviction, consequences, cruelty, compassion. We want to see the conviction for sin, the consequences of spirit in feeling, the cruelty of the Sanhedrin, and the compassion of Stephen. Concerning the conviction for sin, anywhere the true gospel is preached, anywhere the word of God is spoken, anywhere the spirit of God is leading a preacher to proclaim the good news, the glad tidings, the covenant message, and to proclaim the mystery of the kingdom, you'll find out something. The hearers will be convicted of their sins. Now, conviction does not mean conversion. Conviction does not mean repentance. Conviction does not mean salvation. It just means the Holy Spirit applying the truth, applying the word of God so much to the hearts of the people that are hearing. They are touched. They are preached. They are caught to the heart. They are convicted. They are made insecure. And they are made to tremble because of the weight and the load of their sins. After that conviction, after the touching and the cutting of their hearts, after the pricking of their conscience, they may repent and be converted. They may rebel and be condemned. Now, in the case before us, they rebelled and they were condemned. But in other cases in the Bible, we see that the people have been convicted and they have repented and then they become converted. Now, you must understand that in the preaching of the gospel, the purpose of the preacher is not just to present an interesting message, a light message, a lively message, a message that makes people to just be at ease? No. You see, the, the message of a spirit-filled man of God is supposed to bring conviction for sin on the hearts of the people that are living in sin. In John chapter 16, John chapter 16, we're told of the ministry and the office of the Holy Ghost in the life of a preacher, in the life of a man of God. Pay attention. John chapter 16 verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, profitable, necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him, the comforter, unto you. Please, my brother, my sister, look up here. Jesus was talking about the comforter, talk, coming to the apostles, the preachers, the men of God, the women of God. Now, the question is, when the comforter comes into a man of God, and that man of God is preaching the gospel in the power, in the anointing, under the influence of the comforter, listen to me, does that mean that the Holy Ghost will be comforting the sinners in their sins? You know, that is what some people feel. That is what some people think. That when you really have the comforter living in you, abiding in you, and you are preaching the gospel, you are comforting the sinners, you are comforting everybody, every time, under all conditions, in all places, at all times. You know, it's not like that. It's not like that. Because we are told in verse 8, And when he, the comforter, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because i go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged so then when the holy ghost is living abiding inside a man inside a woman and that man or that woman is given the privilege and the opportunity of declaring thus says the lord the word of god conviction will come upon sinners now look up here i'm so surprised that so many preachers pentecostal preachers and uh, charismatic preachers what they think about the infilling of the Holy Ghost, they feel that when the Holy Ghost is upon you, every time you're speaking in tongues, 
when they should be preaching the word of God, they come before the congregation and instead of explaining the word of God, interpreting the word of God, preaching about salvation to the sinners and preaching about the need to have the Adamic nature cut away from the heart of the believer to live a life that is a glory that is bringing glory to God. You know what those preachers are doing? They just stay before the congregation and they speak in tongues. But you know, it shouldn't be like that because when the Holy Ghost has come and the preacher, the man of God that is full of the Holy Ghost is preaching the gospel he wants to yield himself to the Holy Ghost that the Holy Ghost will take the word he's speaking and then the people will be convicted convicted of their sins now listen I've told you that when you preach the gospel and the Holy Ghost is using you that does not mean that everybody everybody is going to be born again be converted no it has never been like that it will never be like that listen to me Moses spoke the word not everybody accepted Pharaoh had in the search the magicians resisted him and many of the Egyptians rejected what he said but then some people accepted they believed nor preached the word you know what not everybody accepted what he said even though he was a righteous preacher you know that joshua also spoke the word of god we are not told that everybody received what he said we read of one Achan that disobeyed the word of the man of god and died a premature death and went into the judgment of god we find that David also proclaimed the word of God. Not everybody accepted what he said. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and all the people in the Old Testament, they all spoke the word of God. Some repented, some rebelled. And you know John the Baptist, that man that was proclaiming the word of God, making straight the crooked path and telling the people to repent because of the kingdom of God, which is at hand. Some repented, some rebelled. Jesus, the prince of preachers. Jesus, the greatest of preachers. Jesus, a teacher, a preacher, come from God, whose ministry of preaching and healing and healing the sick was attended by miraculous signs and wonders. You know what? Some repented, some rebelled. And Peter, the apostle, we are told that some people in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people repented. In Acts chapter 3, connected with chapter 4, we are told that 5,000 people repented. But you know what? In chapter 4, the closing verses, and in chapter 5, some members of the council were standing, were sitting down, and Peter spoke the word of God to them. They rebelled, they rebelled, they didn't repent, and we are now hearing about Stephen. He also has been declaring the word of God. And here we are told they were caught to the heart. They were convicted. They were arrested because of their sins. But they did not repent. They rebelled. Now Jesus has told us this. That anywhere, anytime you are preaching the gospel, you can look for four different attitudes. Four different types of soil. Four different types of hearers. Some will be the heart by the wayside. They hear they don't understand the devil comes he takes everything away they are not converted other people will be people of the stony ground and they have heard but then because it's a stony ground a rocky ground it will not take root and therefore it will not bring forth fruit and then others will just be sown among the thorns and the thistles and because of that the thorns will grow up and choke the world and it will become unprofitable to them but then the first part good soil good heart they hear they repent they become converted now we see these people here instead of yielding themselves to the lord they refused they resisted they were caught to the heart now let me throw some light on this do you know that many times preachers compare one another Maybe preachers of the same denomination, preachers of the same church, they compare one another. They compare one another with how large their churches may be. But you know, you don't judge by that. For example, take us here. I preach the gospel here by the grace of God. We find many people coming to the Lord. And there are people preaching the same doctrine, preaching the same word of God in some difficult areas. And you have just a small number, small number, repenting and coming to the Lord. Doesn't that mean that uh, I have more of the Holy Ghost? Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't that mean that I preach more of the truth? Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't mean that I am more effective? Maybe, maybe not. 
uh, you see, the, the response of the people doesn't depend only on who is preaching, what is being preached. It depends on the conditions of their hearts. Conditions of their hearts. Sometimes the audience is true. You see the audience that Peter was preaching to in Acts chapter 2. Don't open, let me just tell you. There were people that came to Jerusalem. And as they came to Jerusalem, they heard the noise of the speaking in tongues. When the believers received the Holy Ghost, they were amazed. They were surprised. And they were astonished. And they came together. They said, what meaneth this? They were ignorant. They were in darkness. They were sinners. But they were open-minded. They wanted to know. They needed an explanation. And as Peter rose up and he gave them an explanation, many of them repented and 3,000 were converted. At another time in chapter 3, um, a, a lame man had been healed and they were surprised again. And because they were surprised, they gathered together. They said, what is all this? And Peter began to say, why are you looking so intently on us? I say, by our power, holiness, we have done this. And he told them about Jesus. And in Acts chapter 4 verse 4, we are told of the people that believe, 5,000 men. But now, that's a type of audience. Open-minded, free normal regular type of audience but then the council they came together in chapter four and he said we must arrest this situation you know they didn't want the truth they were biased when you are preaching to a biased congregation there's difficulty when you are preaching to a hardened congregation there is difficulty those members of the council they were hardened and they were biased they were prejudiced. They knew the truth, but they hardened themselves against the truth. It is like witnessing to Pharaoh. It is like proclaiming the truth before Nebuchadnezzar. It is like telling the people that knew but deliberately closed their eyes and closed their minds and shut their ears from the truth and telling them to open their eyes. They said, even if you convince me, I will not be converted. I will not allow you to get into me. I've made up my mind. I will never receive what you are telling me. You know, those people are difficult to convert. And that is the condition, that was con the condition of the council. And those people, they just said, what are we going to do to these men? As to the fact that a notable miracle has been performed, we know it, but we don't want to receive it. What are we going to do to them? And the same thing with Stephen. The members of the council, they made up their minds. They were antagonistic. They were prejudiced. They were biased. They were negative. They didn't want the truth. And at the end of the whole thing, they were caught to their heart. They were convicted. And they rose up and they just bounced upon him. And they killed him. Now, if you preach and people are not converted, does that mean that you have no reward? No, my brother, my sister. You be faithful. You do what the Lord wants you to do. And the reward will be waiting for you. Here is Stephen. You see that nobody got converted at this time among the council. They were biased. They were prejudiced. They were hardened. And while he preached, he, they didn't even wait for him to give out a call. They just got rid of him. But you know what? Jesus stood up wanting to receive him. A gallant preacher. A forceful preacher. A dynamic preacher. A successful preacher. Not because you can count the number of converts. Not because there are so many people that filled decision cards. But because he told the truth. The way the Lord wanted him to tell the truth. And he yielded to the Holy Ghost. And there is reward for him in heaven. I want you to see in um, Second Corinthians. Chapter 2. From verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Aren't you surprised that we, the preachers, the ambassadors of Christ, were a sweet savor of Christ? In them that are saved, we're rewarded. In them that perish, we're rewarded. You say that is surprising. Let me explain to you. God has sent us to preach the gospel. We preach it. We discharge our duty. We are faithful. We are honest. We are biblical. We are dependent upon God. We are yielded to the Holy Ghost. And we have done everything we should do. And because of that faithfulness, even the people that rebel and become eventually condemned, we have done our duty and yet we are rewarded in heaven. 
and the people that repent and are converted well we're not responsible for their conversion we just told them the truth and they yielded to the lord and day two day two they are uh, they 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 receive the lord jesus christ and for them on their behalf were rewarded as well stephen will be rewarded Noah was a good preacher, even though only seven, apart from himself, only seven yielded to the message. Uh, you see, it is not because of the number of the people that actually get converted. We do our duty, we do our responsibility, and um, we, we just uh, leave the results to God. Now, does that mean then, since we are not the people that convert, since it's the work of God, the work of Christ, and the work of the Holy Ghost, does that mean we preach carelessly? No. You must prepare the message. And you must tell it as the Lord wants you to tell it. You must tell it in the wisdom of God. You must tell it at the right time, in the right place, with the right people, for the right result. Even though you are yielding, you are giving the results to God. Now, listen to me. There are times that people get punished for preaching the gospel. Like you've seen the case of uh, Stephen. Stephen. Like you've seen the case of the apostles. And now, if they get punished and they have done what the Lord wanted them to do, the time the Lord wanted them to do it, in the way the Lord wanted them to do it, there is a word for them in heaven, whether people get converted or not. But listen to me. Suppose as I'm preaching now, there is uh, somebody who, is, uh, who may be in the auditorium. And he says, well, they are not particularly talking about salvation. And salvation is very, very important. And then he just rises up, just as you are there. And then he, he, he turns around and he faces about uh, 20 people in front of him. And uh, as uh, I am talking here, he is also talking there and is preaching the gospel. And he say, well, because they must not go away without hearing the gospel. And what they are talking is not particularly a salvation message. Therefore, I don't want these people to go away without preaching the gospel. I suppose somebody now among us in the congregation will just rise up and go to the newcomers who just came today as a city now in one place and it says, well, this is the only chance because they must hear about salvation, being born again, being converted. And since the message is not directly on being born again, I must preach to them. I'm talking here and he's talking there. And the ushers come and they drag him and they carry him away. And people start to lay hands on him, praying for him as if something is wrong with him. And he says, well, I'm suffering like, uh, like Stephen. The preacher has said, whether the people get converted or not, whether they understand or not, or not we are going to get rewarded. Will he be rewarded? He is a Confucianist. That's fanaticism. That's not like Stephen. Listen to me. Uh, you know, Stephen did not talk until they gave him a chance to talk in the council. When all those accusers were accusing him, you know, he did not say, Here, yeah, the word of God does say the Lord and begin to preach. He kept quiet. And at the right time, when they gave him chance and they said, Stephen, what do you say to this? Then he began to talk. Now you have heard of an edict recently that came out in Lagos State. And uh, they have said, in the public buildings, that is, the, the, the buildings that the government have put up, that they do not want uh, anybody just carrying the Bible and reaching out and saying, hear, uh, hear the word of God and begin to preach. Now suppose somebody will say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to act like Stephen. And uh, you, know, you rise up in those government buildings and you begin to preach the gospel and then the policeman, they come to arrest you and they lock you up and eventually they are punishing you. Well, you say, praise the Lord. I'm suffering for righteousness. I heard on Monday, whether they get converted or not, I will be rewarded. Will you be rewarded? No, sir. Listen to me. Stephen did not go to the house of the high priest. And whether the high priest wanted it or not, in his own building, the building that had been given to him by the religious, political people of Israel, and say here, Jesus Christ is the Savior. Whether you like it or not, I am a preacher. You must listen to me. If, not, if he suffered like that, that will not be suffering for righteousness. That will be fanaticism. And you know, they say that in the bosses, that uh, they do not want people rising up and preaching, uh, preaching any message, whatever, whether it is Christianity or any other message. Now you say, if, if you say, well, I will not accept that. I must go and do it. And then you are arrested and you suffer. You say, well, I thank God. I thank God. I just praise the Lord. Because 
my reward is in heaven. There was no boss at the time of Stephen. And you don't have to stay in the bus before you can preach the gospel. They are not telling you not to preach at all. They are saying they want to regulate the preaching of the gospel. Listen to me. When they imprisoned Peter, the angel came to him. You know what the angel said? The angel said, arise and stand and go into the temple and preach the gospel. The angel did not say go to the corner of the street. The angel did not say go to the train or go to the bus. The angel said you go to the temple where everybody recognized that that is the place you preach to them. And they will allow that. You go there and preach to them. You see, when we read our Bibles, we are very, very intelligent. And we follow the word of God. Well, if they allow it, we do it. If, for example, you invite me to your house at 12 o'clock in the night. And you say you want to hear the gospel. I will go to your house. I'll come to your house and pray to you at 12 o'clock in the night. But if you say, I sleep at 10 o'clock. I don't want any preacher coming to bombard me with the gospel, with the preaching. At 12 o'clock in my house, I won't do it. That's your right. That's your right. If you invite me, if you give me the opportunity, I'll do it. If you don't, I won't. Now take a person who says, well, I'm a child of God. I'm a preacher. And whatever I do, whether the people get converted or not, I will be rewarded. And then at 12 o'clock, he goes to knock at the house of uh, the manager of a corporation. And they opened the door. They saw this man, Bible in his hand. And uh, they said, from where are you? He said, I'm from Bagada. Man of God. Filled with the Spirit of God. What have you come to do? This is 12 o'clock. I come to pray for you. And I come to preach to you. Repent. Except you want to perish. If you don't repent right now, you are going to hell. And uh, the man signifies to the wife and says, please help me phone emergency. And uh, the, phone, and then the, police, uh, the policemen come and they catch you at 25 after 12 in the night. And they go to lock you up. And you are laughing and rejoicing while the policemen are taking you away saying, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm suffering like Stephen. And eventually they charge you to court and they charge you not for preaching but for robbery. Because they think you are just using Bible to cover. If you go to somebody's house at 12 o'clock like that, you are looking for another thing. And then they say, Okay. Go for only five years imprisonment. When you, are, you say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. My reward is in heaven. You will be surprised when we get to heaven that there is no reward for foolish action. There is no reward for fanaticism. There is no reward for doing something which is not at the right time to the right people in the right place in the right way. And so we see Stephen. Stephen was doing what the Lord wanted him to do. Because they gave him the chance and they called him and they said, Now you have been accused of speaking blasphemy against God and against Moses and against the law and against the temple. What do you say to this? And he began to talk. And it was a dynamic, fervent message that he gave. Now, look at it. They had been convicted, but they did not yield. They rebelled. But now in verse 55, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. What are the consequences of spirit in feeling? Now you must listen to this. I've read so many books on being filled with the Spirit baptized with the Holy Ghost and remaining under the unction, the anointing, the power, the influence of the Holy Ghost. And I find that most of the books written by Pentecostal people, charismatic people, you know the only thing they know? They know about speaking in tongues. And you know we believe in speaking in tongues because it's in the word of God. It's a wonderful, enriching, refreshing experience. But, my brother, my sister, if that is the only thing you know, if that is the only thing you do as a result of being full of the Holy Ghost, you have a small, small fraction of the, com of the consequence, of the evidence. You have a small fraction of the benefit and the profit of being filled with the Spirit. And uh, let me just show you that this man was full of the Holy Ghost. 
And as he was full of the Holy Ghost, he saw beyond the physical. And he said, I see the heavens opened. When you are full of the Holy Ghost, my brother, my sister, you will always, always see beyond the physical. You will always see it beyond the physical. Not only that, he was full of the Holy Ghost and he was receiving divine support in a crisis. Note that down. When you are full of the Holy Ghost, when you are going through a crisis, there will be divine support, divine enablement. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And when they called him to question, the Holy Ghost was talking from within him. And when you are full of the Holy Ghost and they call you, they question you, you will be so full of the Holy Ghost that what you are to say, when you are to say it, the Lord will be bringing it out of you. He was full of the Holy Ghost and when he opened his eyes, he saw heaven. Heaven far away, he was far-sighted, he was visionary. He saw the vision of heaven, the glory of God in heaven. My brother, my sister, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, you will see more of heaven than, than earth. You will see in whatever situation, whatever condition you are, the heavens will be open to you every time. And you will see, you will see the Lord standing to answer your prayer, the Lord standing to receive you, the Lord standing to welcome you, the Lord standing to approve and to accept your person and for you as a child of God, that is a great thing you are looking for. He was full of the Holy Ghost and there was no fear within him. When you are full of the Holy Ghost, the spirit of fear will not be bothering you anymore. When you are really full of the Holy Ghost, he was full of the Holy Ghost and he was declaring the word of God with boldness, without any fear or timidity. That's the evidence of being full of the Holy Ghost. Now, look at Luke. This is so important, I don't want you to miss it. Luke Chapter 1, verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe lived in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. My brother, there is no full stop at the end of that. He, she was filled with the Holy Ghost. Why didn't they put a full stop? Because they are going to tell you now the outcome, the consequence, the evidence of being full of the Holy Ghost. Verse 42, and she spake out with a loud voice saying, Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. When says this to me, that the mother of my Lord is come to me. What is that? That's a revelation. Nobody told her about Jesus being conceived of Virgin Mary. Nobody told her that uh, Mary was already pregnant and Jesus Christ would be born by Mary. No, but she was full of the Holy Ghost. And you know what? When she saw, when she saw that Mary, and Mary greeted her, and she was filled with the Holy Ghost, immediately prophetic utterance came out. Immediately she began to see the very plan of God, the program of God, that Jesus Christ the Lord will be done, will be born. And she said, when says this, that the mother of my Lord is come unto me. When you are full of the Holy Ghost, it is not only speaking in tongues, it is also that God will be giving you divine utterance. Utterance in your own language, but prophetic, and that will look far beyond, uh, beyond the physical, beyond the material, and you will be seen into spiritual things. Verse 67, and his father Zacchaeus was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now what is the result of that being filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied? You see that? Divine utterance. Because you are full of the Holy Ghost. And in verse 67, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. That's the evidence and that's the consequence of being full of the Holy Ghost. Again, prophetic utterance, divine utterance. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led, was led by the Spirit. You see, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, the Lord will be leading you. The Spirit of God will be leading you. You won't have difficulty taking decisions. He will be guiding you, directing you, controlling your actions. And the, the things you are doing will be controlled by the Holy Ghost. Have you ever seen people that say they are full of the Holy Ghost? and they speak with tongues and they don't know how to take the right decision in marriage in christian work in their career in their work 
They don't know how to find the will of God. But you know, when you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're under the control, under the influence of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit will be leading you. And in verse 14, Luke chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Please listen. Jesus had just been tempted by the devil. All through that time, Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. Do you know what? When a man that is full of the Holy Ghost is undergoing a trial, a temptation, when a man full of the Holy Ghost is undergoing a harassment or temptation of the devil, after that temptation, after that trial, he is still full of the power of the Spirit. A man that is full of the Holy Ghost, anytime, every time, is in the power of the Holy Ghost. He may not be, he may not be uh, speaking in tongues all the time, all the time, but when he opens his mouth, there will be prophetic utterance. When he opens his mouth, he will be talking beyond the things that are physical, the things that are material. It appears there is a reservoir within him of the knowledge of the Almighty. And he's talking out in the fullness of the Spirit. Come to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, verse 13, is come, he will guide you into all truth. That's wonderful. You know I see many people, not here, outside, who say they are full of the Holy Ghost, and they easily get into error. Think about it. False doctrine. But you know when you are full of the Holy Ghost, He will guide you, not into error, into all truth. And that is one of the evidences of um, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. One of the consequences, not evidence. One of the consequences of the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You know, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, sometimes you go to a bookshop and you pick up a book, you've never read it. You want to consider whether you are going to buy it or not. And there will be an alarm clock inside you. And the alarm is ringing very, very loud as we are touching that book. I'm talking about a man full of the Holy Ghost. Because there is deadly error, deadly poison inside that book. And the Holy Ghost is ringing an alarm inside your heart. Because the Holy Ghost is guiding you into truth. Or sometimes you are reading a book. The first chapter is terrific, wonderful, very good. The second chapter is very good. The third chapter is very good. And you come to just the last chapter. And it's going to just throw out a little poison. And again, because you are full of the Holy Ghost, you are being led of the Spirit and guided into all truth. And it's going to tell you, well, the first, three, the first five chapters are good, but this last one is just error. You see, that's the ministry and the office of the Holy Ghost for the people who are full of the Holy Spirit. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He will show you things to come. The gifts of the Spirit come along, alongside with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, being filled, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And then he went on to talk to them. In the fullness of the Holy Spirit, in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, when you are full of the Holy Spirit, there is boldness in you. You have boldness to stand for the truth, to declare the truth. In verse 31, Acts chapter 4, verse 31. You go into some assemblies, some churches, where they talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, being full of the Holy Ghost, and um, you see that uh, the people are always shaking, shaking, shaking when they pray. And uh, if you are new there, and you touch one of them, you say, excuse me, friend, come. Why is that person shaking like that? The person will look on his side. Don't you believe in the Holy Ghost? He's full of the Holy Ghost. I remember before I was uh, born again, before I was converted. 1962, 1963. Those two years I spent looking for the Holy Ghost. Just praying for the Holy Ghost. And in the church I was going that time. You know the story. Let me remind you. Maybe you are forgetting and uh, you know we rolled on the ground we wore our white garment we, we burnt our candles 
And uh, you know, when I'm in the vehicle, and I'll be, I'll be very, very quiet. And once in a while, I will shake. Once in a while, even when ordinarily in my house, on the street, anywhere, when I feel well, Holy Ghost, are you still there? Holy Ghost, are you still there? And to make sure he is there, I shake a little. But you know, it is not like that. It is not like that in the Bible. It is not the people that were shaking. It was the building that was shaking. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaking. The apostles were not shaking. The prophets were not shaking. The evangelists, the members, the disciples were not shaking. But the place was, was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with what? With boldness. That is the evidence, that is the consequence of being filled, being baptized, being full of the Holy Ghost. So then you understand. Listen to me. Somebody says he's full of the Holy Ghost. And he speaks in tongues. And you check up his life or you check up her life. There is no boldness. There is no truth. She can't, uh, she can't or he cannot detect error from truth. And there is no prophetic utterance. He or she never sees beyond the physical, beyond the material. He or she never knows about the deep things of the Lord. And whenever she reads the Bible, she always, almost always forgets. And she will say, well, I don't even know what is happening to me. I don't have hunger, thirst for reading the Bible. My brother, my sister, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, there will be a hunger, a thirst, a desire, a, a passion within you to want the Bible, to read the Bible, and study the Bible. And then the Bible says it will bring to your remembrance all that I've told you. The Word of God will just be remembering it day and night, day and night. When you are full of the Holy Ghost. Now in um, Acts chapter 11 verse 23 and verse 24 for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people that's verse 24 where much people was added unto the Lord. You see when you are full of the Holy Ghost your life your message your comportment your reactions, everything around you, you'll be attracting people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Your language, your conversation, the smile you wear, every action that you put forth, everything will be used of the Holy Ghost because you're full of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, he'll be drawing people, drawing people to the Lord. He was a good man and was full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord. I want you to see Ephesians chapter 5. This is an important passage. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You notice there is no full stop at the end of verse 18. Why? Because now the apostle is going to tell us, if you are full of the Holy Spirit, this will be the consequences. Verse 18, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, sometimes what surprises me is that I see people that profess they are full of the Holy Ghost. You know what I discover? I discover before the meetings, the light, the frivolous, the jest, the joke, the exaggerate, the lie. And then once they come into the church, these people who, who are professing or pretending to be full of the Holy Ghost, who have just been joking and jesting and frivolous, who have just been talking foolish things, they come to the church and they are sanctimonious. And they begin to say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. They raise up their hands, they raise up their faces to heaven, and they appear as if they are full of the Holy Ghost. My brother, it's not like that. It's not like that. When you are really full of the Holy Ghost, before you even come into the church, right in your home, right on the street, anywhere, you are speaking to yourselves, not foolish talking. Not jesting, not frivolity, but psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now listen to me, listen to me. I have not found yet a spirit-filled believer in the Bible who has graduated from singing spiritual songs. 
and you find some so-called sisters, some so-called brothers, we come to worship the Lord and they pretend they are full of the Holy Ghost and they are full of the Spirit of God and while we are singing spiritual songs and hymns and choruses and we are clapping our hands rejoicing before the Lord they are so full of the Holy Ghost they cannot open their mouth to sing it's not like that, it's not like that they think if they open their mouth to sing the Holy Ghost will go away will fly away and they will become dry and shallow I hope you are reading the Bible. And there is no full stop at the end of verse 19. It says in verse 20, Still part of the consequence of being full of the Holy Ghost, giving thanks always for all things unto God. I've never found in my Bible a person full of the Holy Ghost and something happens and he said, Oh God, where are you? Oh God, where are you? We are done for. We are crushed. We are defeated. Oh God, have you forgotten us? I don't find people full of the Holy Ghost like that. I find people who are full of the Holy Ghost in every situation, at all times, at all seasons. They are saying, This is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. Those are people full of the Holy Ghost. The people who are full of the Holy Ghost at all times, in all conditions, whatever the situations in their lives, they are saying the Lord has created us, the Lord has made us, and His praise is protecting us. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to those who are called according to His purpose. That's what the people who are full of the Holy Ghost are saying. And then in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Listen to me. Nobody, nobody, full of the Holy Ghost. At that time when he's full of the Holy Ghost will be rebellious and stubborn and heady. And, and you know there are thousands of so-called Christians, Pentecostal Christians, charismatic Christians. They are stubborn, they are heady, they are disobedient and they profess to speak in tongues and they profess to be full of the Holy Ghost. I don't find that in my Bible. I find that when you are full of the Holy Ghost, number one, you are speaking to yourself in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, and you are making melody in your heart to the Lord. You are giving thanks for all things, always unto God and the Father of Jesus Christ in the name of the Lord, and you are submitting yourselves, you are submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You found anybody that is uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost, really baptized and really full of the Holy Ghost, divorcing his wife? I've not found that. I've not found that. But, but don't you find people who say they are full of the Holy Ghost and the wife cannot submit to the husband? That's not in the Bible. When you are full of the Holy Ghost, that gentle dove, that spirit of God will make you submissive to your husband. Will make the husband submissive to the headship of Christ. Will make uh, the members of the church, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, to be submitted to the leaders and the pastors of the church. And the pastor himself, when he's full of the Holy Ghost, you know what? He'll be submissive also to the, uh, to the uh, contributions and the suggestions and the leading of the men of God that are surrounding him. It's not a lone stranger that is stubborn and heady, doing his own thing in his own way, the way he likes it and when he likes it. He's a leader, but then because he's full of the Holy Ghost, he's lovingly submitting to the cooperation and the contribution of the whole uh, member of the church of God. Members of the church of God. That's me full of the Holy Ghost. But you know, you find all these people who shake and tremble and speak in tongues and, you know, say, repeat the same words all the time, pretending that they are full of the Holy Ghost. My brother, my sister, it's not like that. Let's go on. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. And don't you find these evidences in his life? What have I said tonight, which you have not found in the life of Stephen? Haven't you found him looking up into heaven and telling us prophetic utterance? Haven't you found him exalting the Lord Jesus Christ? Haven't you found him speaking in faith? Haven't you found him telling the people about the Lord Jesus Christ being full of the Holy Ghost? Haven't you found him even in this situation in which he was submitting himself in the situation? Haven't you seen him giving thanks for all things always, for everything that was happening? Haven't you found him praying for his enemies? Haven't you found him rejoicing in the Lord because he was full of the Holy Ghost? Have you not found him telling the enemies Behold, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God because he was full of the Holy Ghost. 
And my brother, my sister, when we are full of the Holy Ghost, it is not only speaking in tongues. As an initial evidence, you speak in tongues, but your life after that, your life after that, will be having all these consequences of being full of the Holy Ghost. And if all these, if all these consequences are not there, the speaking in tongues, listen to me, is worthless. It means nothing. It means nothing. Because in the final analysis, the speaking in tongues and the life and the ministry of the man of the woman that is full of the Holy Ghost, that speaking in tongues is just a small part. It's just a small fraction. All these other things must be there. Now, in Acts chapter 7, when he said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear about the Son of Man, about the Son of God, about Jesus, about heaven. And they were religious. Religious people. Who don't want to hear about heaven? Religious people. Who don't want to hear about the glory of God? Religious people. Who don't want to hear about the vision of the glory of God in heaven above? Think about it. And there are many people like that today in many, many churches. You talk about heaven, you talk about Christ, you talk about salvation, you talk about the glory of God, you talk about the throne of God, you talk about things beyond this earth, things beyond material things. And what do they do? They stop their ears. Only religious, but they don't want the truth of God. And when Stephen said, I see the heavens open, and I see the Son of Man standing up there at the right hand of God, they couldn't bear it. It was too spiritual for them, too high for them, too great for them to understand or to comprehend. They stopped their ears and they ran upon him with one accord. They were mad, angry, furious. You know, the Greek word for run here is the same word that is used in the Gospels when it said the evil spirit sent out and entered into the swine and they ran violently into the, into the lake. It's the same Greek word. The evil spirit just came upon them and they ran upon him because they didn't want to hear about heaven and they cast him out of the city. That's no big deal. That's no big deal. As they cast him out of the city, he's looking beyond. He has seen another city already. The city of God. Having foundation. Whose builder and maker is God. And they stoned him. That's no big deal. They had already rejected the cornerstone for the building of God. Jesus Christ. And if, you, if they rejected the cornerstone, the rest they could do was just to stone the Stephen. And while they were stoning him, they were just dressing him nearer the cornerstone. They were dressing him nearer the shepherd, the savior. And they were dressing him nearer the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. You know, they wanted to really stone him. They wanted to really get rid of him. And uh, what they will do those days, if they condemn the person for being a criminal, they will drag him to the cliff. And that cliff will have a ditch down below. And the ditch below will be the height of the double of the height of a man. And they push him headlong. And when he falls now, if he dies like that, that is the end of it. If he doesn't die like that, they turn him over and they put a stone. They just match him with a stone. If he dies, that is the end of it. If he doesn't die like that, all the witnesses that witnessed against him, they will, they will just stone him. They stone him to death. And you know, they dragged him like that. So that they could really do it. They collected all their clothes and they put the clothes in the hands of a ringleader. You know, somebody said, bring your clothes. Deal with him. And uh, that ringleader, Stephen saw him. Stephen knew it. He prayed for every one of them and said, God, don't lay this sin to their charge. Leave them alone. Don't punish them. Just forgive them. You know what God did? This is just chapter 7. Stephen went home. And you ask, does that mean that the ministry of Stephen was ended right there? No, my brother. That prayer he prayed. Chapter 8 comes along and in chapter 9, that prayer was the thing that arrested Saul of Tarsus. And God arrested that man and said, Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And he said, what will I do? 
Why is, that, why is he asking that question? Listen to me, my brother, my sister. Nobody preached to him. But he was there when Stephen was preaching. And that thing that Stephen had preached some time ago, that thing was inside his heart. And while, while Stephen was kneeling and saying, Oh God, forgive them. Let not this sin to their child. He had all that. And he would ne never hear any other preaching. That was the only preaching he had all of his life before that time. And he went to Damascus. And the Lord said, You Ananias, go to him. Because he prays already. How does he know how to pray? He had seen Stephen praying. How does he know how to receive the Lord as his Savior? Yet Stephen had told them like that in the council. And when Ananias got there, he said, Brother Saul. What converted him? What converted him? The preaching of Stephen... The prayer of Stephen, the ministry of Stephen, the grace in Stephen, the gift in Stephen, the radiance in Stephen, the glory of God shining upon his face as that of an angel. It never left him. And that man came to the Lord and he stepped into the shoes of Stephen. They stoned him too, that Paul. They beat him too, that's all. And you know, he became a teacher to the Gentiles, an apostle to the Gentiles, and he was the one that God used to, be, to give us much of the New Testament. He preached the kingdom of God, the uh, word of the kingdom. He preached the mystery of the kingdom. He did a lot for the Lord, and at last he said, I fought a good fight. It's a fight all through. You think that Stephen had not worked for God? Oh yes, he worked for God. And Saul stepped into his shoes and gave us the greatest apostle that ever lived. Stephen was not a victim. He was a victim. He was more than a conqueror. Right there at the end of his life, he was still praying. And while they were him, he called upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Where did he go? You hear some people say you go into limbo when you die. No place like that in the Bible. You go into purgatory when you die. Now, where did Stephen go? Purgatory? Into fire? Where the fire will just refine him and punish him more? Oh no, Jesus Christ was already standing up saying, I welcome you. And when a great man is coming into the house, what do you do? You stand up. And Stephen, the first martyr, Stephen, a man of God, Stephen, a faithful person to the Lord Jesus, stood up and said, Stephen, welcome home. Welcome home. Receive my spirit. What did Jesus say when he was going to die? Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. And the father received the spirit. And what did Stephen say? Jesus, Lord, receive my spirit. And he went to heaven right up. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Listen to me. Have you ever found a man full of the Holy Ghost cursing, abusing, getting angry, beating other people, and telling them that God will kill them and destroy them because they are full of the Holy Ghost? Never. Not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. This man was really full of the Holy Ghost. And whatever they were doing, because of the fullness of the Holy Ghost, all he could do was to kneel down, saying, Oh Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. As for these people I'm leaving behind, count not this sin against their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep in the hands of Jesus, in the bosom of Jesus, in the hands of the Prince of Peace. And the peace of God passing understanding just surrounded him and he went to heaven you know one of these days either the trumpet will sound or the Lord will call us home you'll see the father you'll see Jesus at his right hand you'll also see Stephen he's made it he's fought a good fight he's gone to heaven is rewarded in heaven now and I believe the grace that saw him through that same grace will see us through the grace that assisted him and he was faithful until the end the same grace will make us to be faithful until the end and as he was full of the Holy Ghost and we see all these consequences in his life I'm praying that God too will fill us with his Holy Spirit and these consequences and evidences and results and profits will be upon every one of our lives in the name of Jesus let's rise up and talk to the Lord before we go talk to the Lord from what you have heard
You've seen the Spirit of God in the life of this man of God. Wonderful experiences that he had. Who believe in the Holy Spirit. Who believe it is possible to be baptized and filled and full of the Holy Spirit. You've seen that after you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you are spoken in tongues, you continue in your life. And if you remain full of the Holy Ghost, you've seen the evidences, the consequences 